Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our colleagues and friends over, all over the world. My name is Anita Nudelman, and I am the chair of the IUAS Commission on the Anthropology of Pandemics. It's an honor for me to welcome you to the International Science Council's fifth webinar, webinar on COVID in the social sciences, entitled Understanding and Addressing the Pandemic, Insights from Anthropology. This webinar is hosted by the International Science Council in collaboration with, with the World Anthropological Union, which encompasses the World Council of Anthropological, Anthropological Associations and the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences. The later is composed of scientific commissions focusing on different spheres of anthropological research and practice, such as our Commission on the Anthropology of Pandemics. These are platforms for anthropologists worldwide to share and discuss issues of common interest through panels, conferences, roundtables, seminars, webinars, and joint projects. In name of the World Anthropological Union, I want to express my appreciation to the International Social Council for initiating this important scientific collaboration. And now to the issue of our webinar today. In February 2020, the world we knew began to change rapidly due to the new coronavirus pandemic, which was accompanied by quarantines, fear of the unknown, the lack of available treatment and deaths. Anthropologists' attention rapidly began to focus on COVID-19, trying to understand how it affected different life spheres, while also offering context and culture sensitive recommendations to cope with the emerging pandemic. One of the first issues discussed among our commission members was the influence of COVID-19 on people living with HIV and AIDS. Our commission had previously focused on HIV and AIDS. Since at the beginning of the pandemic, the supply chain of antiretroviral drugs was interrupted in many countries, leading to blown up AIDS, which had not been seen in years, and to the increase of HIV infections, which was slowly reversed a few months later. Since then, our commission members have organized 10 panels in two international online IUAS conferences in which anthropologists, together with professionals from related disciplines, including public health, psychology, and ecology, have focused on a myriad of issues related to HIV, such as it with to, excuse me, to COVID-19, such as water management and sanitation, food insecurity under lockdowns changes in the cultural patterns of dust rituals and bereavement, governments and decision-making related to the pandemics, indigenous and traditional responses, gender-based violence, and the pandemic's effect on vulnerable populations such as migrants, refugees, people with disabilities, and LGBTQs. And lately also on the attitudes and belief towards vaccines and vaccinations. For further information on the commission of the anthropology of pandemics, I will post an email address on the chat. I'm sure that our webinar today will provide important insights related to the pandemic and how it has changed our discipline, as well as a fruitful discussion. It's now my pleasure to introduce the chair of this webinar, Professor Craig Calhoun, who is a professor of social sciences at Arizona State University. Previously, he was a director of the London School of Economics and Political Science, president of the Bergen Institute and president of the Social Science Research Council. His publications address politics, economics, the impact of technology and social change. The floor is yours, Professor Calhoun. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anita, for that introduction, not just to me, but to our important discussion. It's a pleasure to represent the ISC in this discussion. The International Science Council has an enduring interest in how science is organized and supported, and a very specific interest in the ways in which we both respond to the current pandemic and are shaped in our future developments by the pandemic. The series of discussions of which this is a part has taken up different disciplinary perspectives. Um, first and foremost, to learn ways in which the different disciplines have brought knowledge about the pandemic to their research practice and to wider publics. And secondly, 
to understand how engagement with the pandemic has shaped research and knowledge formation in the different disciplines. Today, we focus on anthropology. It's a discipline particularly important to me because although I've spent most of my career identified as a sociologist, anthropology is the discipline that brought me into being a social scientist. So it has a, a primacy in my uh, intellectual orientation, but also it should be a discipline important throughout the social sciences and the sciences. It has a distinctive way of bridging between the social sciences and the natural and physical sciences, which is one of the agendas of the International Science Council. Like all disciplines, anthropology is varied. It's varied by nationality and region in the world. It's varied by subfields. It's varied by analytic agendas. So we don't imagine that even as rich, well-informed and wonderful a panel as we have here today can simply give the anthropological perspective. Um, Melissa Leach, our outstanding initial speaker, will attempt to give um, an overview, but it's also her view in significant ways. And um, we will have three great respondents. Let me introduce everybody briefly now, and then I will call on them as the times come. Melissa Leach um, is director of the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex. Uh, she's a distinguished social anthropologist uh, who has also been very active in a range of interdisciplinary fields from science and technology studies to sustainability to African studies. She's carried out long-term field work in West Africa. Uh, she has organized and herself been a leading researcher in um, issues of health, sustainability, and development. Uh, she's written books, including Vaccine Anxieties and Epidemics, Science, Policy, and Social Justice. She has uh, been a lead author of important international reports and studies. All of this information and a bit more is available online in the biographies that are posted, so I won't try to repeat it, but having uh, heard Melissa on previous occasions, I can say that she is a wonderful person to take on this daunting task of trying to help us understand how anthropology is responding to the pandemic and how anthropology is being affected by the pandemic. After her remarks, which will last about a half hour, Lenore Mandelson will be the first discussant. Lenore is Distinguished Professor of Public Health and Medical Anthropology at the University of Witzwatersund in South Africa. Uh, she spent most of her career in Australia before moving to Witz about, well, a little less than a decade ago. Um, and she has done important work, uh, especially, I think, on inequality and the social context of infectious and chronic diseases. This has led to a range of publications, including a recent book called Viral Loads. The second discussant will be Pashal Kum Awa, who is the chair of anthropology at the University of Yaounde in Cameroon. He has been active in research and as a consultant for a variety of governmental and intergovernmental organizations. His research has focused on reproductive health, various neglected tropical diseases, epidemics, and indeed COVID-19 itself, and issues of research ethics as they apply to studying all of these subjects. Francisco Ortega, the third discussant, is the, a research professor at the Medical Anthropology Research Center of the Universitat Rovira in uh, uh, Catalonia, and he's the Catalan Institution of Research and Advanced Studies professor, indicating the source of this. He's also a visiting professor at King's College in London, a member of the advisory board of the Movement for Global Mental Health, and the steering committee of the Global Social Medicine Network. His own individual research has investigated especially the interactions between global biopsychiatry and local psychiatric epistemologies, the revitalization of social medicine, 
as an intersection between social science, medical practice, um, and policy, and the emergence of new forms of solidarity and mutual aid in the context of the pandemic, which is our focus today. Let me remind everyone that they should post their questions for the panelists in the Q&A function on Zoom, and you can post them at any time while the panelists are speaking. Now, with no further ado, over to Melissa for our main presentation. Thank you so much um, to all of you and to the ISC for this enormous honor to, to present to you today. Um, I must say, as I've, it's a fairly daunting task, um, but I shall do my best. And um, it's a great privilege to be with the discussants. I'm looking forward to a really valuable discussion. So, Lisa, like sorry, this is Alison. Before you start, can you just flick the little message on top where there's an X that says recording on? Yes, I can indeed. And then we're ready to go. Thank you. Okay, except my screen is not working for sharing. Um, you're, you're, you're good to go. Please go ahead. I've done it. Go ahead, Melissa. Um, wait a moment, because I'm not moving on. Hold on a minute. Um, I don't know. Oh, I've got to do it this way. Okay. Um, so I should start by elaborating a little bit more my positioning. So as Craig has so nicely introduced, I am indeed a self-declared social anthropologist. I've got more than 30 years of ethnographic experience, mostly in West Africa, also in the UK, and also in global settings where I've looked at um, an array of health and social and environmental issues, including vaccines and zoonoses. How I got into pandemics was first of all through a program I led within the STEP Centre on the social dimensions of epidemics and then a collaborative program on zoonoses called Dynamic Drivers of Disease in Africa, um, which ended at around 2013, just at the moment when the Ebola epidemic began in the very tri-border region between Sierra Leone and Guinea, where I had spent so much of those previous decades. And um, along with colleagues in Sussex and in Sierra Leone and with networks around the world, we began to try and bring social and cultural knowledge to assist a response that was really badly failing. And um, I'll say a bit more about that. It morphed into what we now call the Social Science and Humanitarian Action Platform, um, which is a partnership also with Anthrologica and the London School of Hygiene, which is doing the same kind of thing for COVID. And in parallel, I'm now involved in a program called Pandemic Preparedness, understanding concepts and practices um, around um, disease and pandemics in African settings. So the, the kind of logo soup around this screen are some of the partners and colleagues I've been working with, including those at IDS. Um, where we've got a number of initiatives going on. And I really just want to emphasize that my reflections now inevitably draw on those experiences. They're inevitably partial, they're selective in a vast field as I'll show, and they're very much um, an input to discussion and not the last word. So I was asked to talk about two questions. And just as a sort of foretaste, I want to say, about both of them, that the answer is a lot, but with much more to do. The potentials and future agendas are important and compelling, as well as what's happened so far. And also with respect to both questions, they're about the what, the content of anthropological contributions, empirically, theoretically, and to policy, but also very much the how. And I do want to reflect on the changed ways in which anthropologists are now working, methodologically, collaboratively, and across disciplinary, geographical, and science policy boundaries, with some real positives, and I think that's my overall message, but also some really big challenges and dilemmas too. So to start with the first question, what's anthropology done for COVID? 
Well, one starting point here is the article COVID-19 Risk, Fear and Fallout in Medical Anthropology, published at the very start of the pandemic in March 2020, where Lenore Manderson and Susan Levine note the long-standing and vital contributions of anthropologists to understanding epidemics and pandemics, their effects on social, economic and political life, as well as health, and their toll on health workers and services, from HIV to SARS to H1N1 influenza to Zika and then to Ebola, as well as the local outbreaks of many, many other diseases. And as they point out, and as is clear, anthropological contributions often rest on this detailed close focus ethnography of encounters and processes, showing them to be thoroughly social. Um, underlining a really quite basic insight, I think, that epidemics and pandemics are social phenomena as much as, and I would argue even more than, epidemiological or biomedical ones. So anthropology is a vital and indeed fundamental complement to epidemiology biomedicine in understanding them. And yet, to non-anthropologists, Anthropology's contributions have often been stereotyped as giving insights into first, other people and places, and secondly, culture, with all the contested definitions of that term. And in important respects, I think this underlay the invitations in to UK and global Ebola science policy processes that our team of UK and Sierra Leonean social anthropologists found. So culture, in the case of Ebola, has often been really central to public discourse and media accounts. And this epidemic, when it started in 2013, was happening in places really very far from centres of power. Ebola needed anthropologists, so it seemed, especially as the external response was foundering so badly with violence to health workers and stoning of vehicles into villages. Um, but the interest was really quite selective. And while anthropologists were considered to contribute uniquely to understanding things like funeral rituals and the care of dead bodies, care for sick people and everyday practice and dilemmas were not seen as subject to cultural norms and sensitivities. So post Ebola, we began to see global reports like GLOPIDAR's Towards a People-Centered Epidemic Response which recognised the value of anthropology and for a while we witnessed some new calls to kind of bring on the anthropologists, but often along with their sort of best practice protocols as if somehow anthropology was the latest magic bullet, a tool somehow or a therapy. Um, so while many of us wondered if perhaps anthropology of epidemics had now kind of come of age, we also wondered and worried about this instrumentalization. So as COVID began, I think both this positive spirit and the dilemmas prevailed. Um, and it's proved both an exciting and heady couple of years, but also a challenging one, as it has proved much more difficult to get traction, especially on other scientific and policy debates than it ever was with Ebola. Why? Perhaps because of scale and globality, COVID is everywhere and at home. It's certainly not other to anybody anywhere. And perhaps therefore, because culture and anthropologists somehow to unlock it in that stereotype role were not seen as so necessary. Instead, and worryingly, the call has often been for social and behavioral science, often centered on rather narrow views of social determinants of health or behavioral economics and psychology. So, that's a kind of slightly dispiriting reflection on where we are. And yet, and this is where I really launch into this talk, this has not stopped an absolute flourishing, a deluge, if you like, of anthropological work, which has, I think, proved, as anthropologists themselves would have predicted, that COVID really, really does need its distinctive and diverse and reflective insights. And as I will come on to argue, there have been some practical ones too, in policy and in operations, even if these have sometimes been against the odds. So I'm going to begin then with a very brief run through this deluge, and it has been staggering in ethnographies of how the disease and response have played out in different parts of the world, different settings, different people, bringing lenses, lenses attuned to the multiple aspects and implications of the epidemic, 
to meaning, meanings and experiences. It's gained engaged with diverse theoretical traditions in the discipline, and in so doing added to nuanced, sometimes even overturned insights from other disciplines. It's appeared in a huge number of places, journals, special issues, emerging monographs and book volumes, and importantly, a vast array of online blogs, forums, webinars and proceedings and more. And in an effort to help keep track, there have been some attempts to bring them together. One I think that's been particularly useful is the Alliance of the Society for Medical Anthropology, Medical Anthropology Quarterly and Somatosphere, who've been producing a weekly compilation of medical anthropology COVID insights. It's a vast set. So looking across and adding to the themes in that compilation, and there are many other themes as well, provides a way to group, um, at least loosely, numerous works in which I can really only begin to highlight a tiny number of examples, but I think it's worth doing. So, themes. The politics of life and death and health have been crucial, and this has included ethnographies of the playing out of the disease in terms of who's affected and how transmission and experience run along social contours and conditions. So, Lenore Manderson and Aya Wahlberg have explored the experience of COVID really well for those living especially with chronic conditions in South Africa and beyond. We've seen Joshua Paul and colleagues ethnographies of care relationships in Germany, tracking um, impacts in institutional settings such as, an, in, uh, such as an assisted living facility, where relationships proved to be pivotal sites for both intensified risk and pronounced consequences for social life more generally. Just two tiny examples. Governance and public health. We see here some, again, really compelling ethnographies of public health responses and how lockdown, social distancing and more played out in particular settings, the authority relations involved and their impacts, social, economic and interpersonal. So Ala Udin in Bangladesh found that unfamiliar terminologies like lockdown and quarantine were interpreted within local logics that often backfired from a public health perspective. For instance, the government's March declaring of a general holiday to prevent social contact, which triggered massive crowds of more than 15 million people living cities, leaving cities for their village homes, with all the transmission risks that that entailed. Here and elsewhere, ethnographies have highlighted the reasons why people have found it impossible to follow guidelines like social distancing amidst, for instance, super crowded living conditions in low income settlements or resource constraints around hand washing where you've literally got no water. In our own pandemic preparedness project, Moses Balaku and Grace Akello have explored how Uganda's pretty heavy handed and militarized response with its halting of trade, its lockdowns, its farming and worship halts and appalling livelihood and livelihood impacts unfolded while cases were actually minimal. And for many, COVID remained a quote, disease of the radio, yet rather suited a government wishing to quell pre-election political opposition. And in the very different contrast to context of Taiwan, Chia Yulian has interpreted the government there as very tight early control measures, which were epidemiologically effective in many ways, but socially devastating through lenses of Foucauldian biopower. Turning to clinical encounters and infrastructures, anthropologists have explored clinical settings, especially the experiences and interactions and agency and struggles of care workers, frontline workers. Brid Phillips did so, for instance, in Western Australia, a region already remote and vulnerable and suffering from things like bushfires, highlighting incredibly vividly the emotional costs and stresses of waiting for COVID to hit in healthcare facilities and how health workers' anxieties escalated to fear and how their own interpersonal relationships provided one way of mitigating those. Precarity and inequity, often intersecting inequities, have been key themes. Thus in the UK, Laura Baer at LSE and her colleagues studied households and community experiences amongst people who are already experiencing intersecting disadvantages amidst the UK's social cleavages and austerity policies of recent years, and how the new norms of social distancing and exclusion served to intensify that precarity. And then we saw 
in October 2020, a wonderful special issue of American Ethnologist edited by Kaylin Dowler, who, that, who termed the phrase intersecting crises and looked at how COVID, climate, economy and politics were themselves coming together to bring about unequal experiences and intensified precarities. A concept that our team again built on as intersecting precarities in exploring how the COVID response was, inter was intersecting with existing forms of precarity and vulnerability in African settings. But on the more positive side, um, anthropologists have highlighted emergent socialities and solidarities. In Buenos Aires, Maria Florencia Blanco Esmores and Anesia Hios explored how reciprocal help was arranged digitally through WhatsApp channels um, amongst urban residents. And yet they also identified what they called a kind of individualizing, moralizing solidarity amongst people who moralized their neighbors for going up and down the stairs or for using the terrace for gymnastics, solidarities that at the same time excluded others. Others, often taking perspectives broadly definable as critical medical anthropology, point more heavily to structural power and political economy, analyzing both disease and response, or sometimes a lack of response, in terms of structural violence. And a standout for me here is Francisco Ortega's colleague, um, colleagues tracking of the Brazilian government's handling of the pandemic as an intensification of Bolsonaro's real abdication of responsibility for public health governance, itself defined by a consistent scientific denialism, promotion of discredited treatments, dissemination of fake news, freezing of public health funding. And they explore how the most destructive effects of that neglect have been felt amongst black and indigenous communities as a form of what they term as necropolitics. Masking, nice anthropological topic that, um, and it might seem an obvious one. Indeed, perhaps slightly naively, I encouraged our Sierra Leonean colleagues in pandemic preparedness to explore whether Mende villagers, who I'd always um, understood as um, people who had um, traditions of masquerades and embodied concealments, which were a very important part of pre-pandemic social life, as to whether people made any connection with the masks being distributed um, to deal with the pandemic. No such culturalist luck. There are researchers' major ethnographic insight was that actually it was motorcycle taxi riders, or carder drivers, who really liked masks because they formed really useful shields against the dusty roads a very practical kind of an insight. Masks did though prove to have social and political salience beyond ideas of protection in some settings. So for instance, Nicolette Makovi, Makoviki explored what she termed the nationalist necropolitics of masks in European settings, which could be both big visible signifiers of disease, inviting stigmatization of their wearers, and also of civic duty and national patriotism, as in Slovakia, where Prime Minister Igor Machevich would brief the press in white masks decorated with a small Slovak flag, defining greater good in the form of the national body politic. So the themes go on, and I think it is worth just briefly scanning through them. Vaccines have more recently in the pandemic become a focus, and anthropologists have returned to an updated, long-standing interest to critique and nuance public health notions of vaccine hesitancy and explore relations with bodily, social and wider political experiences. Our own pandemic preparedness project did so, reworking ideas that colleagues and I had put forward around vaccine anxieties in the earlier 2000s to show how inequities in supply intersected with demand and how villagers in Sierra Leone, for example, interpreted the bumpy, scarce, interrupted supplies of Sinovac, AstraZeneca and Johnson in terms of what they saw as Western and Chinese intentions. And as supplies steadied out and people began to experience others vaccinated and well, uptake increased, but often understood as for small illnesses akin to children's immunizations, rather than for a COVID pandemic, which few now see as a problem. And in this way, the social and technical meanings of vaccines can be seen to vary really dynamically at the interface of supply and demand. Others have related vaccine confidence to nuanced notions of trust, distrust, and citizen-state relations. 
Nice example in this vein is a recent British Academy supported study of coal fields in Wales and Appalachia in the US, where in both places, vaccine uptake was higher outside than in the coal field areas, which informants themselves interpreted as related to their previous negative treatment of minors by governments, distrust and ill treatment. Migration and borders have been a focus of really critical anthropology, with Smina Akhtar, for instance, elaborating on the tragic death of a Syrian refugee in a hotel detention in, as a form of European state racism and authority as it met the pandemic. Or we have Natasha Iskander in the very different setting of Qatar, looking at how COVID and its cordon sanitaire played into restrictions and discrimination against migrant workers, again helping to redefine the nation through public health. Ecology and more than human perspectives have been relatively scarcer, but extremely interesting, linking disease environment and ecology. So one finds here works that link the pandemic and climate change, both as disruptions in the Anthropocene, such as in Zoltan Bodhisgar's really nice account, or works that explore multi-species connections in today's nature cultures, often taking anthropology beyond the anthro, my own revisiting of planetary health and ideas about viral spillover in the light of COVID has tried to do that or a compelling and really unusual piece by Nasina Selim, who narrates viral agency in a piece told from the virus's point of view. Anthropologists have also engaged critically with health communications and conspiracy, such as with the concept of an infodemic publicized by the WHO and others, representing publics as blank or confused slates, instead unpacking how different people's readings of information dis and misinformation are always going to be conditioned and shaped by their social and political settings. And then we have works which have turned the ethnographic lens onto the global and national health and related institutions and discourses themselves. In works on narratives of disease and intervention, for instance, Hayley McGregor and colleagues who've reflected on the narratives of success that have been circulating about African responses and leadership at least in part as an overt counter to the victim narratives, which have so often pervaded representations of the content in, continent in global health, or work on the science and politics of the policy process, such as Susan Erickson's interpretation of how governments have managed the tensions between eco economics, health and growth, or how they've produced and used new instruments like pandemic preparedness bonds. So given this detail, massively partial as it is, um, and which I think is important to just skim through to highlight the very richesse, we nevertheless see some cross-cutting themes. And some of those that have really leapt out for me include that COVID is not just a health crisis, of course it's not. It's a social and political and economic crisis linked also to the impact of extraordinary public health and political responses. The significance of inequalities and injustices behind and above and beyond the we are all this all in this together narrative, which we've often seen. The importance of realizing that biomedicine and technologies always have social meanings and they will always be interpreted as such. That revealing all of this requires a critical approach that goes beyond culturalist and behavioral social determinants of health to think hard about power in its diverse forms. And attention to and the significance of non-Western worldviews and experiences and ontologies, including those that go beyond nature culture dichotomies. And then something that's really sprung out for me, I think it's often in anthropological works, that we find affective dimensions as well as those that we might more easily label as rational and scientific and material aspects of COVID. Really important ones to show that this is an emotional set of issues and ones in which anthropological contributions can, I think, help to foster empathy amongst so many of us as we live through them. But there is, this hasn't always just been academic, of course it hasn't, because anthropologists have also been involved in practical inputs to science and to policy. They've done that in various ways. Anthropologists have sometimes been part of national science advisory groups 
in our own UK SAGE, for instance, people like Melissa Parker and, and um, Laura Bear, or in Uganda's equivalent, where our colleague Grace Akello has been part of the National Committee. Anthropologists have joined international committees, such as the, the WHO's Social Science Expert Group, which I've been privileged to be part of. They've also launched platforms and networks to try and operationalize insights in real time, often bringing together not just immediately produced insights, but also reworking long-standing accounts to have real-time relevance, things like our social science um, in humanitarian action platform. Um, and in this, I think anthropologists and operational practitioners, those in health and humanitarian agencies, have been working together and they've been learning together, both changing in the process. Some cross-cutting contributions here of a practical sort include, I think, the really basic message, but one that's often forgotten, is that one size doesn't fit all. Context really matters to policy and response. There have been key considerations which have attempted to help decision makers attune responses to those details of the social and the political and to the social differences that occur on the ground. That sometimes helped to support more sensitive, respectful dialogues, which have been important in response, but are also starting to be listened to and addressed in this flourishing of work about how we now begin to build forward differently, as, as people are saying, post-COVID. Transformative approaches to systems which can foreground equity and resilience. And they've been part two of debates about preparedness, which is so often dominated by a view that preparedness is a technical thing, often reduced to vaccines and diagnostics, and that it is linear. And anthropologists are beginning to show the importance of navigating uncertainties of systems and structures as well as technologies and of attending to local agency and what we, our team has been analyzing as preparedness from below. But this hasn't all been easy. Um, the challenges have included, as I indicated at the start, this constant tendency to instrumentalize. If anthropology is listened to, it's often to assume it as a quick fix or to confine it to certain response pillars, particularly to enabling community engagement and risk communication, which is where the social science pillar of the WHO's roadmap, for, for, for instance, exists, but not relevant perhaps to other policy and response pillars, such as surveillance or infection control or vaccines or eco-health. That relates, I think, to persistent hierarchies such that the mantra of follow the science still mostly means epidemiology and biomedicine, and to persistent silos in which anthropology is often kept with other social sciences as separate from other disciplines. So many of those national committees do that. The R&D roadmaps of the WHO, the UK's National SAGE Committee, where SPI-B on behavioural science sits apart from SPI-M on modelling, although those members of both interact a lot informally. There's also often slippage between anthropology and narrow behavioural sciences, with rather limited interest in the more critical approaches, which are sometimes seen as pretty threatening. So in sum, I think we all too often see a politics of science and policy processes, which takes up and reinterprets anthropological inputs in a rather power laden mode, one could even call a colonial mode, that reproduces dominant power relations and tends to exclude diversity. So moving on, I think we can also turn the tables as, the pan as this webinar asks us to do and think about what COVID-19 has done and is doing for anthropology. Again, I think the answer is a lot, but it's not without challenges and dilemmas. And my remarks here um, group into five areas. The first is, is methodological innovation, because COVID's led to a mass of this, often perforce, as the pandemic and response has blocked the travel, the in-person interaction, so central to normal anthropological practice. And so these innovations have ranged from 
diverse means of communicating with informants from afar, WhatsApp, phone, video links, to turning ethnography around to empower so-called informants to lead diaries, video diaries, different modes of designing and enacting studies from participant observation of online meetings um, to autoethnographies to analyses of social media, such as um, the British Academy supported studies of anti-vax groups on social media, for instance, or our team's attempts to track Twitter posts on disease X in Africa. Many examples here. There's innovation too in presenting findings with COVID often spurring advances in visual and digital and storytelling modes. Many of these I think will be lasting even beyond some kind of resumption of face-to-face -face modes being easier. Many of them blur the boundaries between researcher and subject in some interesting ways. But at the same time, they do, I think, bring new dilemmas. We might ask what might be lost with the loss of face-to-face -face interaction. Depth, perhaps, informality, multi-sensory connections, empathy. Can these really happen online? And new ethical dilemmas emerge. For instance, as the digital poses opportunities for different forms of intimacy and for the anthropologist, for instance, to be virtually present in interlocutors homes. I think these re enlivened debates about methods and ethics are important and I think they need to continue and they'll be productive for the discipline. A second um, impact, I think, on anthropology. Um, has been the shattering of the model of the individual anthropologist and especially one who goes off to study in an other place. This was already under challenge and rightfully so, um, but it's been really, I think, um, shattered perhaps once and for all as we see more leadership and field studies by those in situ, more teamwork and more anthropologists working at home wherever that might be. And so many of us are collaborating and networking as locally engaged anthropologists with other locally engaged anthropologists in quite different places. A new and perhaps more equitable model seems to be emerging of networks of anthropologists working in different contexts, yet collaborating with others in their contexts, um, communicating online and in other ways. This maybe is a more positive equitable model. I think it links up with some of the claims about decolonizing scholarship um, and anthropology and global health. But again, some dilemmas and questions remain. Who really sets the agendas, even in, even in these new collaborative modes? How do flows of funding and resources enable and constrain them and work out in practice? And can this decolonizing of global health and anthropology, which is really an ongoing set of works in progress, really be addressed by this kind of short term change? It's a longer term process we have to engage with. But again, this is an important set of debates and I think it's positive that they've been re-enlivened by COVID. My third um, area is actually the anthropological topics which have acquired refreshed attention or new slants through the pandemic. Harder, I think, to identify wholly novel agendas, although I'm very open to being challenged on that, but all kinds of ways in which long-standing debates are being given new twists and, and new, new kind of areas and emphases. One might highlight in particular the anthropology of trust, um, a, a big focus of attention, some really interesting insights about trust as practice, trust and power, inequalities of all kinds and intersections, technologies, revitalizing and adding to long-standing interests in the anthropology of technology. More than human perspectives and topics, as anthropologists have been engaging with viruses, with ecologies, with vital materialisms. The anthropology of time and uncertainty, receiving, I think, fresh attention, um, along with things like anticipatory anthropologies and anthropologies of futures as well as pasts. There's refreshed interest in that long standing topic about the politics of the state and the anthropology of international institutions and citizen state relations. And then anthropologies of science policy processes, again, given a renewed push. 
But it's not all been um, anthropology on its own. And the cross-disciplinary collaborations, I think, are really exciting. COVID has facilitated and often demanded new and intensified collaborations um, with many other disciplines. And these include with epidemiologists, for instance, in grounding and questioning the assumptions of models, often showing them to be pretty ill-founded and needing that social um, nuancing or indeed contesting. Clinical biomedicine, for example, in analyses of patient experience. Biology, um, in what are often now being termed biosocial approaches, examining things like complex biological and social interactions around the human body in the city, evolutionary approaches, embodied inequalities, aging as a risk factor. Ecology, for instance, in refreshed interest in One Health approaches, zoonoses and the Anthropocene. Political economy in this really important work about tensions in the pandemic between health and economy, or indeed eco economic topics and relationships around informal workers or vaccine production and supplies. And then with political scientists, um, pooling our expertise to understand and reflect on state citizen relations and the politics of health and life more generally, and many more. And I think these collaborations can feed back to advance anthropology itself, theoretically and empirically. But again, they're not without challenges. Um, we constantly have to think about whether actually we're getting at interdisciplinarity, where or rather disciplines remaining in their silos. Hierarchies often remain. Integration is often difficult, but perhaps it should be. Perhaps we're talking about deliberation across disciplines, triangulating between different views, rather than a kind of lowest common denominator squadge that comes from um, integrating disciplines fully. And then questions about disciplinary equity. Can and should, as I would argue, anthropology be an equal partner with other disciplines, which I think it needs to be. Whereas too often we're seeing anthropology as, as the, the left behind add-on that can somehow be explained the behavioural or cultural or social aspects of another discipline's priorities. So finally, but not least, is relevance and rapidity. Um, COVID has massively speeded up and expanded anthropological production. I think we've seen, as anthropologists have felt the need to engage, fast demand, rapid response grants, rapid response publication, and a deluge of it. I think this is a really positive sign, both of the relevance of anthropology and the commitments of anthropologists to engage, and indeed their confidence that they have vital, important things to say, which others are not saying, and which need to be in the public domain and the policy domain. Um, this is happening in a way across the sciences, and this kind of rapid publication is happening in many disciplines. But it sometimes somehow seems a bit more surprising for anthropology as a discipline better known for its long, careful, painstaking fieldwork. Um, it's detailed and therefore often slow analysis and it's eventual communication in monographs or journal articles. I think that speeding up has some real value and importance, but at the same time we need to be attentive and careful that it doesn't compromise that rigour and indeed that it doesn't compromise that careful listening analysis and writing that is genuinely an important hallmark of the discipline. So again, tensions, but a lively debate. So to conclude, in the aftermath of Ebola um, at, I think it was a medical anthropology conference, I presented this diagram, which was um, a very deliberate takeoff from Michael Burroway's um, mid nineties piece towards a public sociology. And what I suggested is that post Ebola, we were seeing the coming into being of what I called engaged anthropology. And the suggestion was that this involves the constant tacking and iterating across this kind of red space and indeed the cube with its time dimension in ways that value and indeed often blur 
some of the discipline's most cherished, and I would say anachronistic boundaries between theoretical and academic work and applied policy and practice, between critical and reflexive work and the instrumental, and between rapid short and real time and long term work. I offer this again now with the suggestion that COVID has a catalyzed even more dynamic and spread and mutual appreciation throughout this cube. And that anthropology is now, to all intents and purposes, engaged anthropology. Is that a question? Is that a hypothesis to be discussed? Meanwhile, to conclude really briefly, in my view, this is a really exciting moment for anthropology and indeed for how the world deals with epidemics. Many momentums and positives on both sides, anthropology for COVID, COVID for anthropology, but also some tensions. There's a way to go, but I think the debate about those is itself positive and needs to continue. And the challenge now is to keep going, both with the contributions and with the reflections, as the COVID pandemic, one might hope, recedes, and to be ready to take what's been learned into the next one, and indeed to cognate global challenges and crises, for these, I'm afraid, are surely going to come. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Melissa. I hope that there is uh, applause going on throughout the virtual audience here because you lived up to the promise that we made of a really wonderful uh, account of anthropology in the context of the pandemic and um, your penultimate red box slide, an anthropology engaged with the pandemic um, engaged with the world uh, as it is changing. So really terrific. I felt during it sad that one of the great anthropological boundary crossers, Paul Farmer, uh, was lost to us during the pandemic um, and couldn't hear this talk, which I think he would have appreciated greatly. I will refrain from saying anything more, all of which would have been positive, enthusiastic, and stimulated by your talk and conscious of time, instead call on our first discussant, Lenore Manderson. Thank you so much, David. Um, and Melissa, thank you for a really brilliant overview of and reflections on anthropology's role in the pandemic um, and the way in which you've highlighted just how much has been achieved in a little over two years since COVID became a pandemic. Um, it was just lovely listening to that laying out of what has happened with the field. COVID's urgency propelled us to reflect on what we had to offer, all of us. Some of us, though, had already worked as anthropologists when HIV unfolded, and we were mindful of the early difficulties of engaging anthropologists and of encouraging others to engage with us. While anthropologists in the end contributed significantly to understanding HIV's impact then and now, it was extraordinary to hear people speak of COVID as the greatest pandemic since the 1918 flu pandemic, certainly from countries where HIV continues to be transmitted. I'm referring, of course, to 2020, not now, when I would have a different perspective of which pandemic might rank as greatest and what that meant. But many of us also had Ebola and Zika in mind and the ways in which anthropologies and anthropologists were brought in, sometimes too late, sometimes too narrowly, but at least acknowledging um, our involvement and what we might have to offer. One of the things that struck me at the time that people began to talk about COVID being such a fast pandemic were the numbers then, and now the numbers today. And looking at HIV again, HIV is 43.5 million that we know of, people have been infected and that's cumulative in the last 40 years. Less than half a million deaths this year. Um, and, um, and that compares with now 502 million cases of COVID and 6 million deaths in two years. 
when COVID pandemic was first officially declared, HIV still swamped other severe potential lethal infections. And so with COVID though, we felt we had a voice and we had experience. And many of us jumped to ensure we were heard. My motivation for viral loads with Nancy Burke and Io Wahlberg was my confidence in anthropological understandings and documentation that any infection exploits existing social and health vulnerabilities and that its impact and measures to contain its transmission would exacerbate existing and create new inequalities in lives and in livelihoods. When we proposed the book, there were less than three quarters of a million confirmed cases, 35,000 deaths worldwide. Our publisher was initially entirely dismissive. What was worth saying about something that would fade out in a few months time? But it was a sense of urgency the sheer excitement for us of watching numbers jump and knowing what this might mean in different ways in the communities in which we worked that propels us. Even so, we weren't soothsayers and none of us could have predicted COVID's massive personal, social and economic fallout. COVID's velocity surprised us all. And I think it says something of the dynamism of the profession that so many of us began to work in the area so quickly and have produced so much as Melissa Leach has so beautifully outlined. COVID has had massive, terrible effects on social, economic and political life, on health services and on health workers. At the same time, it has sharpened our sense of the urgency of parallel pandemic concerns. Racism, for example, and race-based and gender-based violence, all of which continue to unfold and appear to be um, insensitive to all of the efforts to try and address these now and indeed over the last 40 years again. COVID also sharpened our sense of polit political divisions and this in turn has unsettled our expectations of governments, of world order, of hierarchies, and of futures. Anthropologists have the perfect skills to interrogate these and to interrogate their intersections. And hence, I think we were all attracted to this field. But one of the challenges in doing this, I think, and Melissa really highlights it, is how to become involved in this and how to bring together um, our skills with others in order to influence what happens on the ground. I want to reflect on what Melissa refers to as a cross-cutting issue, or as cross-cutting issues, and these include inequalities and injustices, the social pathways of access to and effects of biomedicine and technologies, the politics of this and other pandemics, and how structural violence predicted and proved the expansiveness of inequalities, as indeed Paul Farmer made clear some decades ago. Melissa has highlighted the value of a critical approach relating to this that goes way beyond narrow culturalist and behavioural social determinants of health. In this context, I've been mindful of the creep back of the terminology of social determinants as if it were enough of itself. It has had a second life. But I find this an incredibly limited way of talking about social everything. And the need therefore for critical engagement by anthropologists in the re-emergence of this gloss of the social. Melissa has also spoken of how knowledge of difference and divergent experiences might foster empathy but anthropologists have shown for this and other pandemics that empathy is very unevenly distributed, highlighting how intransigent social inequalities are worldwide. I was particularly mindful of this when I was in lockdown or locked in Australia and couldn't get back to South Africa for work, when Novak Djokovic earlier this year 
came to Australia to play in the Tennis Opens. For those of you who are tennis tragics, you will know what I'm talking about. Djokovic was incarcerated in a so-called quarantine hotel. And his one night stay in a hotel with windows that didn't open, where people were not allowed out of their rooms, created more attention than has been created globally and locally of the dozens and dozens of so-called illegal immigrants who have lived in that hotel for up to nine years or more and continue to do so. COVID's responses have incorporated and better benefited from anthropological contributions and anthropology has been mobilized and operationalized in responding to the pandemic and in diverting or minimizing or mitigating the effects of the pandemic and um, social community responses, as well as government action. But how this has happened has varied enormously by place and over time. In South Africa, there has been a strong sense of the value of um, anthropology and more widely across Africa. Hence, I've been involved in the Academy of Science in Africa efforts to report on COVID as it unfolded in relation to human rights and vulnerability. And I now lead a team of writers for the South African government on vulnerability and responses to the pandemic. But South Africa has an excellent history of policy and maybe my anthropological voice is not surprising but it has a less successful capacity and history in translating this insight into programs and into programs that lead to structural changes. In Australia, in contrast, anthropology's voice is very thin. Everybody, however, is an epidemiologist. One of the points that Melissa makes towards the end, and I want to finish with this, is the promotion of cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approaches, not just for this current pandemic, but as an approach seen to be of particular value as we develop better responses to the emerging crisis of antimicrobial resistance, other one health problems and to climate change. But anthropology's value is sutured to our capacity to retain our disciplinary uniqueness, our strength and our rigour. My own practice and commitment is of anthropology's unique and creative role in applied fields in health, medicine, ecology and inequality. And applied is not for me a synonym of fast. I would not wish anthropology as as a rich discipline of theory, methods and practices to be folded into others and thinned out in the process. This is not a call for retaining silos. Rather, it is a plea for equal respect with the richness of the different contributions that this produces. I end then in endorsing Melissa's emphasis on the out of dateness of a dichotomy of applied and academic anthropology and so call for anthropology to always be engaged without compromise. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lenar. These are terrific comments on their own and a uh, stimulus for Melissa to respond, but I'm going to ask her to hold her response uh, until she's heard from all three commentators since we are running short on time. Before calling on Pashal Kumawa, though, I want to uh, indicate that Melissa has uh, promised to provide references. Uh, a couple of people in the chat have asked for uh, uh, citations and pointers to some of the anthropological work she talked about and to more that brings ethnographic perspectives to bear on the pandemic. Pasha. Thank you very much, uh, Craig. Uh, it's a pleasure
being part of this uh, this presentation. I state. Oh yeah. yeah. I became interested in epidemic few work on the grid that Ebola emerged as a problem. Pasha, we're having trouble hearing you. I wonder if turning off the video would allow us to hear you better. Okay, can you get me better now? That is better, thank you. All right, thank you, Craig. Yes, I was saying that my interest in epidemics and pandemics started when I was doing field work on neglected tropical diseases. And one of my concerns was that I was creating a community of practice a community of practice where everybody was going to get involved in facing a health problem. And the neg neglected tropical disease I was working was on was the Burundi ulcers. We were able to pull together different community stakeholders to work and see how they could reduce the burden of, of uh, the Burundi ulcers. In the mid middle of that, the Ebola virus disease started. And when it started, I went into all such missions to see if there were any publications on Ebola. Unfortunately, I came across only two of them. Then I asked myself, what contribution as an anthropologist can I make to uh, highlight the issue of Ebola and that it was a neglected epidemic. It led me to publishing uh, an article, Ebola virus disease in Africa, a commentary on its history, local and global context. When I did it, my conclusion was that Ebola will end, but that will not mean the end of epidemics. And that if the world was not careful, in the next five or 10 years, we were going to have an epidemic that will be on, on a larger scale and at global level, which was equally going to be wider than HIV. Five years after, because I published that, I published that article in 2015, five years after 2019, we started hearing about um, the COVID-19. But in 2016, I became very curious and as an anthropologist to say, but facing this problem does not only end here. Why should I not find out how African countries are prepared to face the next epidemic? Then I engage a PhD student to conduct research on how Cameroon, the country where I'm, com I'm, I'm coming from and where I'm talking from, uh, was prepared to face the next epidemic if not Ebola. As the research was ongoing, in 29, December 2019, I called the student and said, hey, there is an epidemic out there. Why not begin to find out whether Cameroon was prepared to face it? Then he added that on board as part of his anthropological research for his PhD thesis. Then, COVID-19 was declared as a pandemic. When it happened, uh, we became very curious and asking the question, what is, how is the great world going to face it? What is going to happen? Especially when messages were coming that Africa will be the most hit. I want to answer one of the questions, which one of the issues which uh, Melissa has raised, what has anthropology done for COVID? The, 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 the rector of my university, Maurice Soso, Professor Maurice Soso, started looking around for a medical anthropologist who could advise him on what to do. And he was advised to come for me. 
and he invited me to the meeting. After listening to all the scientists, the microbiologists, the uh, virologists in the hall, he said, no, he has one person that whatever he will tell him, he will go by it. Then he turned to me and asked, what do you anthropologists, you and your colleagues globally, what do you have to offer to solve this problem? Then I turned to him and said, it is very simple. Anthropology studies cultures and all the barrier measures and COVID-19 is a cultural problem. It is social, it's biosocial. All what the scientists have said here has presented the, the other social part of the disease. And I said all the barrier measures which we have are culturally grounded. And he said, how? I said, no, masking is part of our cultures. We mask ourselves in theaters. We mask ourselves in building sites. We mask ourselves everywhere. And I told him in Africa, handshaking, hawking is really not part of our culture, original culture. And he said, okay. So what do you advise us to do? I say, well, our campus is not ready to face the COVID-19. Uh, COVID so the best thing we can do as Africans will do when they face a pandemic is that we send everybody home. And if we send everybody home, we should prepare our campus before we bring everybody back to the campus. And when we do it, we can study online. When I finish, he said, okay, stop there. I have my answer. The anthropologist has told me exactly what I have to do. I'm going to close down the campus of this university and all the learning will be done online. They will prepare the campus and come back when the campus is ready for hand washing, for distancing, for every other thing. And then we came out with 13 resolutions. And this is what happened. When he closed down the campus on the 16th of March, 20. 20. That was one of the first countries to take such an initiative. The government of Cameroon had only been doing media campaign on people so that people should do everything to respect the barrier measures. The next day on the 17th of March, the Prime Minister of Cameroon called a meeting during which he took the resolutions of the University of Yaoundé one, and then the, the, the ministers discussed these resolutions and adopted them as a national platform. And the country was closed down. No flights were allowed to come in. No flights were allowed to leave. No movement and movement, I mean, people were advised to move out only when it was very necessary. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this to highlight the fact that anthropologists play a very, they played a very good role on COVID-19 by highlighting the fact that our cultures and which is the focus of anthropology are extremely important. And that anthropology, what Melissa said, anthropologists should not be given a second role when it comes to, uh, when it comes to the COVID-19 and other pandemics. Then, one thing which I will uh, highlight, which uh, Melissa uh, uh, brought up in her, uh, in her presentation was the politics, the political economy. You see, during COVID, there were two things that happened. And I will tell a little story about it. In Africa, what happens is when somebody sees people running, he does not ask why they are running. They just start running. Nobody cares to turn back and ask, why are you running? In the Western uh, hemisphere, what happens? Or in the African societies, they will want to see what happened before they start running. So what happened was when Africans discovered that the COVID-19 was really a big problem and it was going to kill many of them. They didn't wait for any laboratory tested or any trial med medication. They turned to traditional medication and started taking them. 
they didn't wait for any vaccines. The vaccines were coming when they were struggling to survive on the traditional medicines that they had. And besides, they started waiting, wearing face masks before any many other countries did. When WHO said no, face masks were for medical doctors, they said no. If medical doctors can wear them and survive, then they too can wear and survive. So this shows some sort of conflict, some sort of some politics, some power, power of the institute, international institutions and power of people for which decisions are taken. Um, then one other thing which I want to uh, discuss about uh, the highlight, a highlight from uh, Melissa's uh, presentation was she talked about uh, one pandemic, I mean, I want to say that one pandemic leads to another one. Therefore, one epidemic leads to another epidemic. And I want to say, it is time that anthropologists are taken on board to explore further why the burden of COVID-19 was more heavy in affluent societies than in societies which were least prepared for epidemics, for example, Africa. It is time that anthropologists start probing into that and to feed the, science, the other sciences, telling them, well, something has to be done. We need to understand this further because there is another epidemic that is going to come. When I was saying, when I wrote my article and said in 2015 and said that, in five years or 10, there'll be another epidemic. I never knew it was going to happen. And we don't know the next epidemic that is going to occur. So it is time that anthropology should be brought on board and to assume a level position with the other sciences. It should not be neglected at all. So there should be equality with other disciplines. Knowing that anthropology is holistic it means that whatever is happening in the other sciences, the other scientists should know what they are doing. They are doing anthropology without naming it anthropology. I think, uh, thank you, uh, Craig. I will stop here with my discussion. Thank you so much, Pashal. And I'm sorry we had um, some trouble with the link and needed to turn your video off. These are great comments. Um, and I will specifically say, very important comment that anthropology is not simply relevant to the local, but to understanding cross-national and other differences in prevalence and in large-scale phenomena as well. Uh, one of the questioners from the audience has raised the issue of mental wellness um, and differential impact on people's um, uh, mental health and well-being. Uh, this is a prompt, uh, perhaps, to our third commentator, uh, Francisco Ortega. Francisco, over to you. Yeah, th uh, thank you very much, uh, Craig, and the organizers of this event. Well, I, I just wanna make some brief comments from the perspective of a uh, critical medical anthropology of COVID-19, which are intended to highlight some of the interesting issues raised by Professor Melissa Leach in her wonderful presentation. So from this transnational posi positionality, global health homogenizes the COVID-19 pandemic as a predominantly biomedical and public health problem onto which the social sciences are frequently outside looking in. A critical medical anthropological approach highlights the dangers of a narrow cultural or behaviorist focus, as Professor Leach has said, including analysis that divide nature and culture or environmental, animal and human health. We are also extremely concerned about the coloniality of the production and distribution of knowledge about and relating to COVID-19 and the marginalization of illnesses experiences from the global south in the generation and promotion of COVID-19 ontologies, explanatory models and responses. Perhaps most striking, however, is how despite a grow growing public recognition of the way that health inequalities are immersed with and have been deepened by the pandemic, there is an almost complete absence of meaningful and impactful reflections about the structural causes that specifically point to the role of the global political economy in shaping the distribution and rates of mortality. 
The epidemiology social determinants of health framework has sanitized the structural determinants model by overlooking demands for health justice. I would argue that the theory and methods of critical medical anthropology with its focus on the political economy of health are needed to keep a structural determinants and social justice as the center of global health explanations of these and future pandemics. The structural determinants of health are the causes of the causes. They are the social, political, and economic forces that drive inequalities and are determined by people and institutions who hold power. As opposed to concentrating on specific risks, factors related to living and working conditions, such as poverty or education, as the social determinants of health emphasizes, structural approaches speak to the idea that systemic factors drive, promote, and reinforce inequalities through the process of social determination of health. Social determination involves public policies aimed at reducing social stratification and ensuring equity, universality, and comprehensiveness, and transversal programs of community strengthening the value that value social bonds and popular and community participation. Such concepts are more closely aligned with Southern theories such as the Latin American social medicine and collective health. Latin American social medicine highlight upstream social determination or structural determinants of health, such as the unregulated capitalist production, political corruption, and concentration of power. These counter hegemonic ontologies that speak to a different set of solutions based on social arrangements are rarely given prominence alongside biomedical and dominant global health and development frameworks. Critical medical anthropology is a branch of anthropology which considers the political economy of health and social inequality in people's lives. Centering a critical medical anthropology of COVID-19 means asking, for example, how universals such as capitalism as the naturalized social and economic order of globalization put human societies at increased risk of zoonosis through habitat destruction. We, we know now that COVID-19 is likely to be only the most recent of many such pandemics this century. Anthropological research using multi-species or more than human approaches, as uh, Melissa already uh, stressed, is of central relevance for their focus on the dense entanglements between human and animal health. The pandemic has exposed the emptiness of the rhetoric of equity in global health. Inequality is a driving force in the pandemic and confronting it requires global cooperation, solidarity, coordination, and community participation. A social medicine approach that promotes a more complex understanding of the social can open up the black box of inequality, elucidating the structural determinants and social determination of inequalities and helping to reconceptualize global health. Their neocolonial mindset has led to the downplaying of effective, low-cost measures from the global south to promote improving technological solutions. As Misha Khan from the, from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine observes, talking about solidarity networks and their role in pandemic response in Brazil, I quote, there is a myth that the solutions from high-income countries are better, which has led us to overlook countries that have successfully operated more informal community networks. But we have seen how damaging it is to assume that solutions always originate in the global north. A political economy approach to COVID-19 could address how historical, unequal, and neoliberal arrangements, coloniality-defined racism, informal economies, and high burdens of chronic diseases intersect as power differentials within the provision of healthcare, enabling a more comprehensive assessment of the impact of the pandemic. Yet, these non-Western experiences of COVID-19 alongside explanations that point to the social determination of COVID-19 have had little influence on the discourses on global health, of global health, which fails to articulate how our global political and economic system is responsible for the magnitude and to some extent, also the emergence of this pandemic. By arguing for the center of a critical medical anthropology of COVID-19 in global health discourse, 
I do not mean to displace the important biomedical and public health responses, but to us that anthropologies of course and treatment are considered side by side and in equal measure. Advanced biosecurity te technologies which use data mining systems or, or DNA mapping to track virus strains in real time are essential. They make these molecular walls of COVID-19 more and more visible. However, the complexity of a pandemic exceeds viruses and their biological mechanisms of contamination and infection. Uh, the broad qualitative research on the social impacts of the pandemic has shown that this overexposure of the pathogen ends up obliterating our critical view on the most ordinary situations of everyday life, which is where and how COVID-19 contamination happens. Politics is a primary structural determination, determinant of COVID-19 mortality, and we argue for the recognition of this within global health policy and governance to bring political accountability to, this, to the discussion table. The COVID-19 pandemic has challenged theoretical assumptions and overturned the dichotomies and hierarchies such as global local, global north, global south, or top-down policies versus grassroots interventions that structure the field of global health. If the pandemic is not homogeneous, our response to it cannot be either. Cousins uh, and his collaborators argue for a reconceptualization of the architecture of global health as, I quote, categories, crisis, and scaffolding of the global health enterprise are transformed. And to do this, I think we must do away with disciplinary silos and the top-down colonial legacy that privileged the global north and its knowledge production. Fundamentally, confronting the structural inequalities means anthropology and views from the South must not remain critical analysis looking in, but become essential components of this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francisco. And thank you for your uh, stress on something that I think is very important in all of this discussion, which is that anthropology has been perhaps the most important discipline in uh, trying to overcome the neglect of the global south, perhaps the crucial discipline in reversing neglect of Africa in discussions of the pandemic, or limiting the discussion of Africa only to noting the inequalities in global vaccine distribution, which are certainly real and important. We've had several interesting questions from the audience, and I'm just going to summarize a few and then give the floor back to Melissa to respond to all of the commentators um, and including these questions from the audience. Um, she may or may not have time to get to it all, and she has promised that when the recording is posted at the ISC website, she will provide some references to anthropological work uh, many members of the audience have asked for work. For example, um, is there a working group on long COVID or anthropological work specifically on that? Um, is there ethnography on distancing and masks that she would recommend to people? What about um, examples of the kind of community engagement in the co-production of knowledge? that uh, between anthropologists and others in various settings. Um, there's a question that I'm for Lenore and she may, I hope, be able to give us some uh, similar insights. We won't have time here on some of the particular examples of South African anthropology influencing public policy um, in the country. Um, the uh, question, which is really very well developed by the questioner about mental health, includes calling for an emphasis on the extent to which the impact of the pandemic is the impact of the responses that have been chosen, as well as the impact of the underlying disease. And I'm sure we all joined the questioner from the audience who asks, will anthropology be more central in future efforts against the pandemic? Can anthropologists and younger scholars be influential in efforts to mitigate and restrict pandemics in the future? So lots for you to come back to, Melissa. Choose whatever you would like as concluding remarks. 
Okay, um, that's wonderful. Well, um, first off, a really big thank you to, to Lenore, to Patel and to Francisco for a fantastic set of comments. I can't respond to all of them, but this is a, a rough skate through of some of the things I really, I really took. So um, Lenore, I think it was really important to drive home again that the anthropological work on COVID has very much built on anthropological work on previous epidemics or long wave events, including HIV. And that's certainly been the case for the kinds of works that have inspired the approaches that I've taken um, and that, that have inspired the projects I'm involved in now. And I also want to kind of bow down to Paul Farmer, um, whose untimely death at this point is a massive loss to what I would call engaged anthropology. But that's been, been really important. Um, also agree um, very much with where Lenore finished that anthropology should always be engaged but shouldn't compromise on what it is that makes anthropology um, different and special and important and that does include some detail, nuance, painstaking engagement actually with, with questions of power and questions of experience and meaning. We mustn't lose those. I also agree with Lenore that that cannot always be done fast, despite the, the um, arguments and the wishes sometimes of global and public health agencies who would just like to have an anthropological protocol which somehow, or rapid ethnography which, which can be delivered quickly. Um, it, it, it can, I mean there are examples of, of rapid ethnographic work that I think can be quite useful, they cross over a lot with sort of participatory appraisal kinds of approaches. But fundamentally, I think what we're talking about is keeping the heart of, of, of the intent, the engagement, the, the meanings, the practices of anthropological work, which do take patience and listening and attention and respect. Um, and maybe the, the, the speed, certainly the way I've been thinking about it, comes not necessarily in, in in generating and, and learning and, and finding with others the, the, the evidence, but in the way it can be um, packaged up and fed into operational responses very quickly and in real time. And that's the, the Social Science and Humanitarian Action Platform that I briefly illustrated as just one example of a, of a rapid platform model. Um, the, the evidence that goes into the briefs and the infographics and so on, which are very much for the consumption of, of operational decision makers, often depends on decades of work and, and synthesis of a lot of literature um, that's happened over a very long period. So I think, I think there are interesting models of linking the long term and the, the real time. Um, Pascal, I particularly appreciated your fundamental point that one epidemic can lead to another. Certainly did, of course, in your own experience in Cameroon of how the Ebola experience then informed, informed COVID and the interventions you were able to make there in your own institution. But I think more fundamentally, one epidemic leads to another because the structural conditions in which outbreaks often, well, in which outbreaks sometimes occur through things like zoonotic spillover from ecologies and through which outbreaks become epidemics and sometimes pandemics don't change. And it's understanding the social, the systemic, the political structures through which those things don't change and outbreaks become epidemic, epidemics and diseases transmit along their social and political contours what is one of the key areas where anthropology is needed now and where it can feed into preparedness for future epidemics and pandemics and indeed other challenges. And that's where I also then um, thoroughly agree with um, Francisco. Um, my talk had already picked up on um, the fabulous work. I think Francisco himself and colleagues has been one of the, the most important proponents of a critical medical anthropology around COVID and what that actually means and why it's different from this instrumental set of inputs. Um, but I think his comments went further in ways that I really appreciate. One is this really strong emphasis on structural inequalities and determinants and politics. Um, therefore, the importance of looking at these things as they occur across countries, across nations, but also globally, and particularly those structural inequalities between global north and global south, 
um, both in the politics of disease and response, but also in the politics of knowledge. And also therefore, and I really wanted to emphasize this point, the fact that anthropologists need to be engaging and drawing on theoretical traditions from different places, south as well as north, um, in order to, to engage with pandemics. Um, I would add to that as well, um, that I think there's a vital role for um, anthropologists, uh, well, for, for non-formal non academic theories, the kinds of worldviews that have been highlighted in um, the ontological turn in anthropology and the kinds of non-Western um, understandings of nature and culture, the kinds of perspectives in the Latin American context one might find amongst peoples in the Amazon, or which emerge in, are emerging in our own work in Africa when we engage at the grassroots. And I think there's a role there for anthropologists everywhere to act as they often have done as interlocutors for those perspectives, but more importantly, to begin to shift the structures of the discipline so that um, those holders of those worldviews, what you might call the kind of located anthropologists in diverse places, are putting forward those views for themselves. This is part of the decolonization, the restructuring of the powers of anthropology. Um, there are lots more topics. I mean, as I said, I only skimmed the surface. Really appreciate those that have come from, from the audience, um, mental health communities. Completely agree with that point that um, anthropological work is not just on the impact of the disease, but on the impact of the response in all its guises. That's something I hope to bring out in the themes I did look at, but it certainly applies to something like mental health. And finally, I would just really emphasize that all of this and these vibrant and lively debates, which do need to continue, are vitally important for seeing through what happens with the rest of COVID, really important for what, for preparedness for the next pandemic, um, or perhaps for mitigating it, and also really important for understanding and engaging with the intersecting crises of health, of climate change, of food, of economy, of politics, that unfortunately the world is now in. So my concluding point really would be thank you and bring it on. Let's carry on engaging. And thank you, Melissa, for terrific remarks initially and in this concluding moment. Thanks to all three of our panelists, each of whom raised important issues and each of whom could have given yet another keynote address. Uh, there's an enormous amount of wonderful anthropology. Again, um, I urge you to come back to the International Science Council website uh, where there will be a posting of additional references to important literature on behalf of the ISC and the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences. Thanks to everybody who participated. It's been a great discussion. And Melissa, above all, thanks to you. Thank you.